This is a 20-minute presentation on lean leadership, which has only taken most management schools the best part of 100 years to try and fathom out. So you'll excuse me if this is a bit like leadership on amphetamines. The message I'm trying to sell you is quite, quite easy. The tools that we're playing with under the banner of operational excellence are leading us to a different model of leadership. So the more you deploy things like the ownership for parts of your production process to teams, and the more we put in standard work, the more we're deploying responsibility away from higher level managers, and therefore the greater the need for the leadership. So if you take the tiers of what we've got in industry now, you've got standard work at the bottom, and I've got ownership of my Kanbans and my pool systems and my 6S system. That is deploying leadership responsibility to the frontline teams. They're also doing problem solving. So they're leading their own learning journey. The middle managers are dealing with A3 problem solving processes to do with changing systems, end-to-end -end systems. And the senior management are dealing with policy deployment processes that are also completely changing the leadership model. So if you go back to the 1980s or before, the leadership model in the UK was I point my finger and you do it. That's what leadership meant to us because I had the position power, I point to you, I tell you do it, I don't care about any of your back chat, I don't really want your involvement. The trouble is by the 1970s, you're gonna love this as, a, as an illustrator, we went into the hippy dippy mode of, of overly team working and overly empowered people, which basically said I, I abdicate all my responsibility and go away and do whatever you want. So there was no bounds upon what people did. So we almost abdicated leadership at one stage and now, from our research at the university, we're looking at what does lean and all the Six Sigma and all the TPM world mean on how leaders are changing. So, the next 20 minutes, I'm hoping to sell you one message, that the tools and techniques we're playing with are changing the roles of leaders. And in terms of aligning the three parts of our system, the policy deployment that sets direction, the A3s that determine the velocity of change in our system and how quickly we change, and the standard work that determines how well we add value, are all key parts of creating something called followership. So leadership is equal to followership, and followership is all about how do you get people who don't really want to follow you to actually buy into the vision and follow you. So your tw mission 2015 to be world class is a mission about getting people to follow you. And I think, you know, fair play to you guys, it's a lot easier to stand down there with a PowerPoint pen and point to it than actually do it. This is most of British industry, I'm afraid. We know there's a better way of coming downstairs, but we're still in the do it mode or we're too busy to think about the better way of working. So unfortunately, it just means get banged on the back of the head every day, every week. So this is an old way of not thinking, abdicating responsibility and allowing Christopher Robin to tell us what to do. You're now giving away powers to Edward Bear. Edward Bear has got to make up his own mind. And Edward Bear is looking to you as a leader to get involved with the A3 problem solving process and the standard work to actually ask the right questions rather than tell them the answers. So in the early days of operational excellence and the microelectronics world, we employed great facilitators who went on the shop floor and showed people what to do. That's no longer a, an option. They're there, but their leadership role's got to change because they've got to facilitate change by asking people the right questions. Does that make sense? So whatever we're looking at, our leadership models are now changing. Unfortunately, Deming didn't specify how you create leadership, but he did say as part of his 14 points, it was one of the most important ones. So again, you can understand where policy deployment comes from and where the application of Deming's 14 points fits with our journey to world class in microelectronics. So Deming had a big influence on us. In terms of... Toyota themselves, Toyota are one of the most humble organizations in the world. And if you call them world class, they will go bright red and they will suggest to you that they've only just begun the journey. And that's why they're quite happy to share because they'll learn as much from Siemens as Siemens will learn from Toyota. And I think this is a brilliant quote from one of the, the top guys, one of the original Toyota family. So AG said, there's no point waving a flag if nobody's going to follow you. So hence the need to align 64,000 people in Japan that make cars. And we don't just make cars at Toyota, or Toyota just doesn't make cars. It makes forklift trucks, sewing machines, 
modular houses, speed boats, personal robots to get us down the old bingo. That's coming in the next few years, that we've got a robot that will take us shopping and down to play bingo. Great for South Wales, probably not so good for Oxford and Warwick, to be honest. You probably don't have bingo halls up here. <laughs> so in terms of Fujio, uh, uh, Eiji Toyoda, Toyoda's view was, no, 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 if you're going to do a good job, you need to spend a lot of time convincing people to change. And that means questioning what they're doing. So we all use the five whys to question where a root cause problem comes from. The likes of Toyota and the senior managers will ask you why you came to your conclusion about making a change. So they want you to verbalize your reasoning. They want you to expose your learning to them. So that's about leadership, coaching, and facilitation. So the leadership model is one of innovation and not one of management. This is looking forward. So you can understand why the things we're playing with, policy deployment, A3s, and standard work, are all learning mechanisms. They are all different levels of the plan, do, check, act process. Policy deployment is no more than a senior level leader's version of understanding the future and deploying that into a change challenge. A3s are a plan, do, check, act process looking at a problem that managers tend to have. And standard work is there to instantly spot abnormalities so we enact a problem solving process to learn how to better control the process. So the logic fits together, but on your learning journey, these are fundamentally reshaping your role. You're no longer going to be telling people what to do. This is straight out of Toyota Boot Camp. So one of the first things you see is how people's roles are spent. You'll notice at the top, most of the, the top guys, their time spent doing innovation and thinking about the future. They do less on the daily management. Anybody here do leader standard work? Leader standard work is when my diary has a number of meetings in it that I go to, I stand up and I attend, but they're there to control the business. I'm there for a status update, basically. The rest of my time, my diary is free for me to engage in improvement activities. And the reason why we standardize the diary is so that the daily management, i.e. the monitoring stuff, is contained in the smallest amount possible for the highest level of the organization. Because their value in the business is about thinking about the future and working on the breakthroughs. And then the teams down the bottom that are called associates spend most of their time doing the standard work, making the parts and getting the parts out. We then do a little bit of continuous improvement, usually to improve our part of the production process. So the new model's on the right-hand side. The new model is far more entrepreneurial, and the gentleman who talked about his contract manufacturing company, it's more like your characterization of entrepreneurial ways of working. But the leadership will change from basically being, I have power and responsibility in my role, so I'm now coming to sit in to understand, from your point of view, what is the data you've collected? What does the data tell me in terms of facts? What are you going to do to implement change? So it's perfectly acceptable for senior managers to deal with the detail, but it's part of a learning process. So the right-hand side from our research, and research is ongoing with the likes of Shook in the States, Leica in the States, Rother in the States, is seeing changes in the patterns of leadership as a result of implementing Lean. You're redefining your own value to the business, and your value to the business is that of coach and mentor, not of dictator. And again, this is straight from the Toyota manual. This is the way Shook views the world, that we're there to help our followers understand the right questions to ask in order to pr improve their work. We're not there to tell them what to do. We're there to give them, quite paradoxically, enough freedom so they can go and make changes, but within a bounds of what is tolerably good. And that means that Toyota, people like Toyota will not tell you what to do. They'll expect you to fathom it out, but then they'll expect you to expose all of their prob or your problem-solving activities and your solutions for scrutiny. So it respects the grades in the organization properly. So moving on, our characteristics are typically at the bottom. We're coaching and mentoring as part of this policy deployment process. I know just before lunch, people went on a, a bit of a grab your pants. We're going on a 30 minutes policy deployment review, and it was rather quick, I'm afraid. But the policy deployment process makes sense of every piece of leadership behavior that we have. And typically for policy deployment for the lean companies and the ones we're tracking, they will do two commercial projects and one project to benefit the people in the business. So there'll always be one that changes the constitution or gets greater buy-in. So for every two commercial projects related to quality and delivery or cost, 
there's one that benefits the people directly. And that could be in the safety of the 5S, or it could be in rewards and recognitions. So in terms of the levels, most of us have different parts of these three levels of the new leadership conundrum. Many of us in the room don't have the full policy deployment. A lot of us have the A3s, and virtually all of us have standard work, as you'd expect from some uh, semi-regulated industry. So what we need now is the leadership patterns to reinforce the right for me to question my production system without offending managers and the alignment of managers in the change. So if you want the criticism of where most businesses are, we've taught people problem-solving tools, but we haven't aligned them to any concept of the customer. And I'm afraid that's a downside of lean thinking. When we wrote that book, or when Dan wrote the book and we did the research, number one principle was understand value in the eyes of the customer. Where do we start? Value stream mapping. That was number two. And then people put their pool systems in, and you think, that's principle number four. And we only told you to put the pool systems in when you couldn't flow production. So we probably haven't done enough thinking about how we make things flow. So in terms of leadership, these are the questions and the logic in terms of where we go next. And then other Toyota sayings, Cho took over in the 1990s. Lovely guy, very bright, not a member of the Toyota family at all, but very much in, in Toyota way of thinking. And he reinforced values of leaders by giving us different uh, quotes. So as a leader, you would work with humility, you'll respect the views of others, and you'll always go to the scientific method, because the scientific method was based on fact and reason and argument. So in terms of Toyota, even the top executives give you the basis of how do you work as a good manager. And then from our point of view, we're stabilizing systems, which is the first loop in this particular diagram. So as you stabilize systems and you give more quality control power to people doing the job, you're changing the leadership behaviors, you're changing the responsibilities in the factory, and therefore you've got to change yourself. As you go through the second cycle here, the blue one, we're getting back up to a former standard. So we're getting back to standard work and how we do things. And if you get into the third learning loop, this is the point at which problem prevention and focused improvement needs management leadership to help share knowledge. Anybody going down a TPM route at the moment will fundamentally change relationships in the factory and their leadership, without a shadow of a doubt. We used to hide our knowledge as maintainers, never share it with an operator, never, because you protected your knowledge base, made you indispensable, really, really. At Toyota, everybody knows the most about their machines. We work with people as part of our study group where the average earnings of the individual is 30,000, the cost of the machine is a million pounds, and they don't know how it works. They've got standard work, but as soon as it breaks down, they haven't got a clue what could have possibly caused it. They also know by turning it off and on again, the old IT trick, maybe it'll come back to life. But how can you do that? As a leader, you fundamentally failed. You've put a million pounds into the hands of somebody who is, with the greatest respect, ignorant. They have no idea of the signs of breakdown or anything. So how are they going to do problem solving? And yet we want problem solving and we want it aligned to the, the needs of the customer. What does they say on Blackadder? Baldrick run towards my fist. There'll be a lot of sore fists in the UK. <laughs> Never mind, we could go back to the 1970s and do all the empowerment stuff again and hug people. That was just as bad. <laughs> as a six foot Welshman, I don't do hugs. I don't mind a slap in, but I don't do hugs. <laughs> and any German in the room probably doesn't do hugs either. So in terms of differently, your leadership model is changing again because you are far more visible. This wasn't the Peters and Waterman American showcase of let's go on the shop floor and let's walk around and speak to people. In terms of your operational excellence, you're spending more time on the floor, you're spending more time in the Bayer rooms, you're doing your Gemba walks, you're feeding back more. You're being seen as the person who actually cares about what's happening. So in terms of the three gens, we're certainly changing the behavior that's exhibited to the people around us, that we genuinely care. We want to know the details. And your A3 process is dragging us further into it, because the A3 process is plan, do, check, act in another uh, form of words. And it's a way of keeping people engaged with the change process. But if your A3 process isn't aligned to where the business is going, 
you are perfecting your current production system. You're not learning how to improve the production system to generate more benefit for customers. Let me put that into perspective. If you made laptops in the past, you made them in batches. Along comes Dell. Doesn't do batches anymore. Does everything one at a time. Nice model. You go online. You pay up front. 20, 40 hours later, you get a laptop. Fundamentally different way of working. Fundamentally changes the system you work in really heightens your dependency on, on the shop floor teams because as soon as they find a defect or they recognize a defect from what they've seen on their charts, they need to shut the production process instantly. You know when we looked on the machine that changed the world? In the West, nobody had the responsibility to shut production lines and they stopped all the time because there was no thinking going on. In Japan, everybody has the right to stop the production line and they never stopped. Why? Because they did continuous improvement and they were led to do improvement because improvement was related to satisfying customers. So what I'm trying to sell you in the 20 minutes was policy deployment is plan, do, check, act for executives and site leaders that's deployed to A3s and the policy deployment process to middle managers who know where best practice is and know what they would do if they ran the business. And that deployment goes down to activities we do to change our value streams and standard work on the shop floor. But the three levels are really three levels of plan, do, check, act. They're just revolving at different levels. So this is your A3. That's your typically completed A3 with all of the facts I need to know. So if I'm a leader, I want to see your logic. Why did you come to the conclusion you did? So this isn't five whys for problem solving. This is more than that. These are images from different shops. Thankfully, nobody here. So I don't know in terms of whether you think these pictures are good and bad. But if you go into our research sponsors, they will quite often have the red, amber, green lights and on lights for leaving doors open in clean rooms and they go off all the time and everybody ignores them because nobody's sensitive to the fact that somebody put a buzzer on something because it's critical to manage it. So it doesn't prompt a reaction, it doesn't prompt learning. People just go, oh, it goes off all the time. Well, let's destroy it then. Because you know what happened when we destroy buzzers? That's when the Townsend Torreson sets out from Portsmouth or Dover, wherever she was, and sinks halfway into the channel because everybody ignored the buzzer that always went off, the buzzer that, con that controlled the bow doors. Not clever. So here on the left on the bottom and the middle on the bottom are indicators on a machine. These are critical indicators on a machine, I'm afraid. And the one in the middle has no oil in the oil sight glass. So it's only a matter of time before that fails. So this isn't a necessarily a bad indicator of a bad operator. This is a bad leader. This is bad setting of standards. There is no scientific management here. There's no respect for the machine, let alone the person. This machine pays my pension, by the way. So as a leader, shouldn't I be sensitizing my people to abnormalities? It's what you're doing with the rest of your quality initiatives. So leadership now is more about questioning, more about asking, more about taking part in the plan, do, check, act cycles. And there's no reason why the director of finance can't take part in an improvement group. Why not? They'll ask the dull questions. So this last slide was put in just to give you a little bit of a tickle. It's not meant to upset you. Probably will. I don't mean to. Just don't give me a hug. Come and slap me, but don't give me a hug. <laughs> so if you've got physical workplace improvement, you've got the 5S, it's good. It's not necessarily good enough. It's just a foundation. If you move up and you've got a clear roles and responsibilities because you've changed the way in which we work, it's good, but it's not good enough. So now I know as a team leader I'm responsible for part of the factory that I must keep disciplined. I put visual indicators in so I know when the process is going out of control because it goes into the red or it goes out of an SPC chart, upper and lower control limit. It's good, but it's not good enough. It just keeps the machines running and it keeps money turning into, or materials turning into cash. The next three are the three that are dictating the change in the leadership model from that left-hand side that we saw on the slide to the right-hand side. These are all about thinking processes. So these are all about joint decision-making from a policy deployment process, all about multidisciplinary teams, because the person who is technically the manager in the room may not be the leader of the improvement effort. They're there for their knowledge, they're there for their support, but they are not there to be asked what we need to do. They're there to show leadership, think about the future and not interfere with what we're doing. We're there to present to them. And that's, in my opinion, and with the early research we're doing, and it's only with about 14 companies spread across different sectors, how you can align daily management 
and the improvement of standard work, which is what this board controls, with changes to your end-to-end -end pathways for your products, which is what the middle managers control, and that is aligned with the policy deployment process, because if you don't have policy deployment, you are waving your flag at the top, and it's not even being seen by the middle or bottom. So if you stick in the mode of standard work and A3s, we're not actually going to make real big changes in line with the needs of the customer. And the thing that we do know is 10 years ago, customers' expectations of quality and lead time are far less than they are now. In 10 years' time, they'll be even more tighter. So all we're doing is regurgitating the cash cycle. We're not thinking about where the business needs to go in the future. And that is where we really stand in terms of research thus far but we're only two years into studying the companies and they're probably seven or eight years into their lean journeys. And some are Six Sigmas, some are lean, and very few are TPM, which is a bit of a shame. But that's where we stand. Nick, thank you very much. You're welcome. We've had NMI membership now for going on 10 years and we see it as a, as a family in that we help them, they help us as a, as a group of companies. So it's been immensely beneficial to us as a parent company. The best thing about NMI is that um, you do get to meet a lot of people in the industry that you wouldn't usually meet. It's easy as engineers to focus on the numbers, uh, what NMI has done. Uh, for us really is to see the commonality between ourselves and the other partners in NMI and we share people and people problems uh, and people challenges and getting people engaged and NMI has helped us uh, to to make that journey uh, and has made a real difference to transforming the business that we have in uh, in Glenrothes. We find it a great learning opportunity and networking uh, opportunity specifically with our supervisor levels with the supervisor workshops so we gain a lot of um, interaction with different companies and um, we share an awful lot of information so we find it very beneficial to be part of the NMI.